Hi, good morning, everybody. Um, I apologize already for some probably background noise at some point. Uh, I'm working from home uh, because one of my son is sick. Um, nothing serious though. So um, I did my PhD actually at the University of California with Enrico Graton. That's why I'm in two phasers. And then uh, I did a few postdoc and one was in Munich uh, in the lab of uh, Don Lamb. As I was saying, I did my PhD with Enrico Graton. Uh, I was focusing more in image correlation, but uh, of course, FASO were there and developing in those years. Uh, so that's uh, how I mostly analyze uh, FLIM data. And uh, um, I would like in this workshop to show you how we implement, uh, how we implemented the phasers in LASIX. But of course, uh, before uh, I would like uh, to tell you a little bit more uh, why we use phasers uh, and giving you a quick introduction. So first of all, why we are using phasers, what are phasers uh, and what you can do with phasers that with, for example, exponential fitting is a little bit more complicated. Sometimes uh, phasers help uh, compared to exponential fitting. One of the application could be uh, splitting components uh, and here we had uh, Oregon Green 488 uh, staining uh, mitochondria and uh, Alexa Fluor 555 uh, staining tubulin. And if we do a two exponential, uh, two component exponential fitting, we have uh, some bleed through. And if we use phasor separation, just looking at the different population, we could uh, see without any, any bleed through. The, this is uh, because uh, we have uh, multiple, multiple components. So Oregon Green, um, so did you hear here that I explain uh, um, how phasers can help uh, in separating species uh, when they have uh, each one of them uh, multiple components? Uh, I will go um, through later to some rules of phasers, but uh, from the position of the phasers here, none of the Oregon Green or Alexa Floor 555 are purely uh, monoexponential. And that's why the exponential fitting uh, get, leads to some bleed through. Other application in which phasers help uh, a lot uh, are flim fret uh, in the case of uh, multi-exponential donor. And uh, actually in biology is often the case uh, that th your donor is not monoexponential. And uh, in the case of phasers, uh, it doesn't really matter where you start your fret trajectory. So you are not uh, influenced uh, by that. Another application uh, that benefits a lot uh, on phasers is uh, NADH uh, in autofluorescence imaging. You have seen some application yesterday and also from the talk uh, of uh, Rupsa data on uh, Tuesday. So, there are mostly two approaches to frame analysis. Uh, one is the exponential curve fitting. Uh, you had a workshop just before this. Uh, and the other one is the phasor plot uh, and is what uh, we are going through today now. So the phasor analysis um, is uh, actually originally used uh, from uh, the frequency domain uh, flim approach in which you have a modulated laser and then you measure how your excitation uh, is uh, changed by the fluorescence event. So usually what you have is a phase shift compared from the excitation. So your emission is shifted in for one phase and the amplitude is lower. So you have a modulation. And uh, if you plot uh, the change in phase in the modulation, you will have basically a phasor plot, a round <laughs> plot. And uh, in uh, the phasers, uh, you have short lifetime happenings on uh, the right part and long lifetime on the left. Why? Because if you have uh, a short lifetime, your phase uh, so will be only uh, slightly shifted and your modulation also. So everything will be very similar to your excitation. So you will have a very small phase and your modulation will be still long. 
in the case of long lifetime, you lose, you will have a longer phase difference and uh, you will lose modulation. So basically you will go to the origin of the phasors. So, but as you know, um, Falcon uh, and uh, other um, technique uh, in FLIM, they use a time domain approach similar to TCSPC. So we need, uh, uh, we have a decay curve for each pixel. We don't have uh, a modulation or a phase. So how do you go from a time domain to a frequency domain? You just transform it. So it's a Fourier transform that move the information from a time domain to a frequency. So basically you are looking to the same coin, but on the other side, on another dimension. And this uh, gives you the two coordinates, G and S, uh, that you can uh, just plot uh, in the phase of plot. And uh, the analysis uh, goes as uh, was done uh, for the frequency domain. And uh, this is uh, an example that a fast uh, decay will be very similar to your IRF, and it will go to the short lifetime. So that is the transformation, basically. And the long decay will just go to the zero. In a nutshell, what a flim phasor looks like, so for each pixel in a flim image, you will have a point in the phasor plot. So then if you have a lot of pixels, you will, and coming from a similar component, you will have a big cloud. And so an important point while acquiring data for phasor analysis is to have a lot of pixel in, of interest in the image. Because if you have a lot of background, a lot of the information will just given by your background and not by your interesting uh, signal. So it's always better to zoom, it's better always to zoom in and having uh, all pixel of interest in a way that your cloud are representative. And then uh, the more photons per pixel uh, you have, the the more defined uh, is uh, the cloud. Um, so there are some uh, rules that are called the algebra of phasors. So um, one and the, one of the most important is that a single exponential lifetime uh, is uh, laying on the universal circle. And this is what we call universal circle. So our uh, coordinates. If you have multi-exponential lifetimes, they will lay inside the universal circle. And uh, phasors cannot be outside of the circle unless there is uh, a delay in the excitation. And one example in which uh, phasors uh, go outside uh, is when you are measuring the lifetime of your receptor in the case of FRET. So in uh, another very important rule that is crucial for uh, most of the analysis is that the multi-exponential lifetimes uh, are linear combination of their individual species. So, and the distance uh, of uh, your data uh, to the single species uh, is giving you the fraction. So the closer it is to the component two, the more component two I have in the mixture and so on. So I can uh, determine uh, which are the components contributing to the mixture and how much is the contribution of each. And this uh, is also valid uh, if you start with uh, multi-exponential. So even uh, if you have uh, a starting point that is multi-exponential and you have something on the line to another multi-exponential, that will be always uh, uh, a fraction of the two and you can uh, determine uh, the contributions. If you have a mixture of uh, three species, for example, this uh, will be inside a triangle connecting the three species. Uh, and this will be valid also, oops, also in the case uh, of uh, three um, multi-exponential components. Uh, and uh, we will have some example later on uh, uh, directly in the software. There, uh, I will show today three main applications of the phasor plot analysis. One will be the species separation, then uh, my biosensing and uh, molecular interaction with FLIM-FRET. So with the species separation, you, you have 
sometimes fluorophores that are very similar spectra and lifetime can give you an extra dimension to explore to multiplex the information. So we could use it for separation. There are mainly three, I would say, type of species separation based on a lifetime. One that goes to the exponential core fitting with image fit, so component separation or with pattern fit. Then there is phasor plot. And uh, even if it's not the focus uh, of uh, this workshop, uh, now with Stellaris, uh, we have a uh, tau separation, but uh, that is uh, a completely different approach. And today we will focus on phasors. So here is a, a very nice uh, sample uh, uh, that we had. Uh, from uh, Stefan Evite Campeters with uh, Vimentin Alexa 647 uh, and actin uh, Atto 647 and phalloidin. Spectrally, they're really overlapping, but uh, lifetime gives you this extra contrast that allows you to separate. And uh, with the phasor, we selected uh, the main components. And uh, now in Stellaris, we have uh, uh, phaso separation tools that uh, calculates directly the fraction of one component and the other pixel by pixel, giving you a uh, very clean separation. Another application that is really important in the flim approach uh, is biosensing. We have a lot of uh, fluorophores that change lifetime because of microenvironment, uh, for example, metabolic state. But uh, another case uh, is sensor like uh, flipper TR. These sensors uh, are changing lifetime depending on the tension of the membrane. And in this case, uh, we kind of mistreated cells, uh, uh, putting some distilled water at the beginning uh, and uh, then some glucose. So we make them explode and then implode. And uh, we could see in the phase of the trace that goes uh, from the baseline a little bit lo longer lifetime and then close uh, shorter with the addition of the glucose. Uh, we will see more um, examples later directly in the software. How we can analyze, uh, get uh, movies of phasers, uh, giving a 3D representation of uh, the lifetimes as well. And uh, fine, um, last but not least, uh, FLIM is the gold standard for threat measurements uh, and phasor as uh, an approach uh, based on threat trajectory on how to calculate the threat efficiency. So uh, as you know, and uh, you heard uh, during this, uh, this workshop, this, uh, this training, uh, in the presence uh, of uh, an acceptor, the donor has a quenched lifetime. So the lifetime of the donor is getting shorter. So you could uh, measuring, uh, by measuring only the donor channel, you could uh, see the effect of uh, threat. So what happens uh, in, uh, in the phasors? So if we start uh, with a donor, we have FRET, and FRET will uh, decrease uh, its lifetime. So what we expect is that it will go to very short lifetime. So, and if we have 100% uh, FRET efficiency, it should go to the end point, uh, to lifetime zero. But uh, in uh, reality, you have uh, always uh, some contribution from background, from autofluorescence, uh, something that is left uh, in the background. So we have to measure where our autofluorescence is. And at this point, if we have 100% uh, threat efficiency, we will have uh, a trajectory that will connect the donor to the autofluorescence. And if you see, this is just uh, the algebra of phasors. Uh, our trajectory will have gone uh, to this point, but we have the autofluorescence contribution. So I have to sum this point to this point to this point. Uh, and depending on how much threat uh, I have, uh, I will move uh, more to the autofluorescence part. And this is how the uh, threat trajectory is built. 
And uh, this uh, line between the donor and the autofluorescence is a straight line and uh, will give you basically how much of uh, your uh, donor uh, fluorescence and autofluorescence are contributing. So if you have some donor leftover, it will be in this direction. Big application of FRET uh, are um, implying the use uh, of biosensors. And uh, there are mainly two types uh, of uh, biosensors. Biosensors that are binding uh, because of some interaction and they lead to FRET or a one chain biosensor that change conformation and uh, change FRET efficiency. So in the case of the dual chain biosensor is uh, similar to the two, two molecules that uh, are binding together, for example, a receptor and a ligand. Um, what happens oops, is that we will have uh, a FRET trajectory, and, uh, but we will have only two endpoints because we have only uh, uh, on and off state. So if uh, our sensor is uh, not attached, we will have uh, the donor contribution. If uh, our um, sensor is attached, is bound, we will have only the high fret. So all the data points that we will measure will be on this line. We will not have uh, the trajectory, we will have a line because we have only these two states on and off. Okay. In the case, uh, instead of uh, a one chain, uh, a single chain biosensor, oops, sorry, what happens uh, is that uh, we will have always a minimal threat uh, because there will be always some that are close enough and get uh, some fret efficiency. So our line, because even in this case, we will have an on-off uh, stage, we will not have anything intermediate, it will be from a low fret to high fret. So here is really important uh, in both case of the biosensor having the good uh, control uh, to have uh, the starting point and an end point. Uh, and basically you will not need uh, all the FRET trajectory part of the analysis. At the end will be a fractional uh, analysis uh, as uh, we will, we have shown, uh, for example, in the uh, phase of separation. And uh, yeah, this I already said everything. And uh, with this, I think uh, I will be ready to show how LASIX film works, uh, unless there are some questions. Uh, should I check the chat? Uh, there are some questions, but I think you you can cover them during uh, the things okay. that you will present. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Luis. Um, should I read them to you? Um, yeah, One is, is the distance of this part of a mixture from the two signal components linear? Yes, it is. So the length of these distances corresponds to duration of the concentration. Yes. And then the other one, how do you determine the angle in the triangle for multiplex experiments? Okay, and that we will see directly on uh, the brain uh, slide example. So we, uh, we have uh, some example with uh, three components uh, and um, will be really useful to, to see directly there. And I will I would like to have these uh, parts uh, quite interactive because we, I will run through the software and if we get the, uh, the question all at the end it will be difficult to understand really the point. So please just unmute yourself uh, and, um, and ask the questions. I will be more than happy to answer directly on, uh, on the spot. Okay. So. I will start, I have different data set. I will start with the phaso separation and then move to biosensing and end up with FRET. In this case, we have the Alexa 647 phalloidin and the Atto 647 and Vimin. No, it was other way around, I think. Um, and in this case, uh, what um, we can see is that we have uh, a nice uh, linear combination of 
to contribution and uh, something else. So we can have a, a kind of triangle. This is a confocal image and this is a stead image. I will start uh, with the confocal. I know yesterday you've seen uh, quite a lot of tau stead, so you know that we are exploiting a lot of the flim information instead. And uh, here we can uh, separate these two. Oh, he did already the other one. I don't want this. Okay. Okay. And you see, I had a nice separation. So you have to find uh, actually the most extreme points in the phasor plot because uh, this distribution here has already some of uh, the red part. And uh, in uh, Stellaris, uh, we have uh, a separate tool that will just calculate uh, for each pixel how much will go in the first channel and how much will go to the second channel. As I said here, you can definitely see there is uh, some other contribution. I think it's worth uh, exploring it. So first, a uh, way to explore, and probably you have seen it uh, already, uh, my mouse wheel doesn't work, will be to go around and the intensity is weighted. So to see where my cyan is, I have to pimp up a little bit uh, the threshold, but basically, uh, maybe with the screen it's difficult to see, but our cyan is here. It's basically coming from the background, from the... Um, we can see it. You can see it? Okay, good. Yes. Probably my monitor is worse than yours. <laughs> I, I really barely see it. With magenta, sometimes it's easier to see remote. Okay. It's kind of dim, I know. So, but it's coming from uh, our mountain mid and in the background. Um, we just go to a better scale, so we'll see our nice cell. I put back to 10. And then uh, our uh, separate function will work also on a triangle base uh, analysis so with three components. And I, want, I don't want the second channel. So, and uh, you can see that now I have uh, my actin, my tubulin, in my background. So here I can confirm that the third channel, this contribution here, is coming from the background. Uh, another way to explore uh, our contribution will be to use uh, uh, I will just go the other way around since the long lifetime are here. I like uh, to be consistent. Usually for me, red is long lifetime. So um, my mouse wheel doesn't work. And here I can really follow how the contribution are different as well. Uh, from So you can see that in this pixel, I don't have only actin because otherwise uh, the actin alone will be red in my scale bar. So here I have contribution from the Vimentin as well. And here no. And here is only Vimentin that is blue. So this is a way to visualize the distribution. You could calibrate your lookup table using this tool. I will make it white. I think I should tell our developer that we don't want the blue on the phaser because you never see it. <laughs> but um, this is the ratiometric tool. You can uh, put uh, the first point uh, on uh, the first component, uh, the second point on the second component. Okay. Uh, no, I delete the wrong one. Sorry. Um, again, sorry. And then you can, uh, in the ratiometric tool, you can 
move here and you will see that the red, here you will get always uh, the ratio of the lifetime one. So lifetime one is the first one you put. So this is the long lifetime. And then uh, you can say, okay, the red is 100% uh, component one. I just uncheck because it's easier. Here, for example, uh, the green is uh, around 37% uh, and then the blue will be 100% of the other. So you could calibrate uh, your ratio metric, uh, your ratio of the components uh, using the ratio tool. An option that we uh, I have shown uh, in uh, during the presentation is this triangle. So you can color and code depending on the three components. So the blue will be here. If you don't like the blue, you can always change it to magenta. So you can always change the three colors if you think it's giving a better view of your image. And even here you see that we select in magenta the background basically. And also for uh, the three components, uh, we have the option of having uh, a ratio metric uh, way. We can uh, investigate, uh, and I will put maybe yellow. I can go around uh, with my tool and select uh, where I have 100% uh, of these. 100%, 100%. So you can really see, and uh, here it gives you the three ratio between the components. I see there are some questions coming up. Um, okay, how is the phaser calibrate? Ah, uh, someone is answering for, uh, for me, okay. If there are any, I'm typing some answers, but okay. uh, perhaps you can elaborate because, a little bit on the because, harmonics. Okay, on the harmonics. Uh, okay, I know yesterday you had. Uh, I know you had uh, some. You had some. Oh, no, we have a drama here. Um, so. So we have. Uh, um yesterday you had some problem with the calibration so the calibration the auto the the automatic calibration will uh, will use uh, the calculated irf to find the, the short components and then calibrate uh, all the phaser autom automatically and um, what you do with the calibration usually uh, if you want to calibrate your phaser you measure you measure a standard uh, everybody can hear you nick you know uh, i'm sorry no, that, that's okay so uh julia maybe i asked the question um, that came up yesterday and maybe maybe daniel or like amanheim can answer it so that you can have a short break here um, so the, the question was that yesterday in the SPA system that we've seen from Trayston, um, they were trying to set or changing the harmonic and it was fixed set to nine and was saying something like um, calibration of the phaser is needed. So my question with that would be, is um, that calibration something that happens in the software? Is it has something that has to be done by the technician in the hardware or how does that calibration actually work? So I would hand over this question <laughs> to you, Luis. No, I'm back. Oh, Julia. Did you hear my question? <laughs> no, I read the, the email from questions. So basically, the automatic calibration uses our calculate IRF to find the different, the modulation and the phase of our zero lifetime point. Mm -hmm. And with that, you can calibrate all the phases automatically. Sometimes uh, 
um, you want to have a, a second control uh, or uh, there are other softwares that require an external calibration uh, or you want to double check, uh, what you can do is measure uh, die, a solution of uh, known lifetime. And usually uh, the lifetime range that is chosen for the calibration uh, is similar to what you expect to measure. So if you are going to measure second harmonic generation, you will try to measure some very short lifetime. If you plan to work uh, with more uh, mm, like a fluorescent protein uh, in the range of 2.5 nanosecond, you will use coumarin uh, to um, calibrate that is in this range. If you are looking for longer lifetime, you will use fluorescein uh, uh, basic pH uh, that has a lifetime of four. And then uh, what uh, the software will do is after you input the lifetime you expect, uh, for example, I put four, four means that this should go in this direction. And if I instead I had two because I had a coumarin, it will be here. And what it does, the software is uh, trying to move all the center of the cloud that you measure there, moving phase and modulation. What happens then is that you basically, you will not have a auto calibrate. You will have uh, your phase and modulation determined by this uh, uh, search. Mm -hmm. And if you close it, this can be done only for the harmonic you selected. So you cannot recalculate and actually you see my phaser went out. But if I, and you see, I select here the harmonic. Uh, if I want to calibrate harmonic number two, I can just uh, change it here. This data uh, would be nonsense because I don't have a solution, but basically, oh, I didn't save the calibration. Yeah. Apply to current. Uh, oh. So if it's two, then it should be actually two here. Ah. Mm. We find a bug. Eh? Apply to current, uh, uh, it moved to two. Okay. And now you see I have a harmonic number two. So the calibration can be done only on the harmonic that you selected here. You cannot then change it. While on the automatic uh, calibration, since we have the IRF that is calculated, we can readjust uh, for any harmonic. So then if you go back to auto calibrate, mm -hmm. you will have the harmonic free. Okay. And uh, the calibration, you can also apply to the acquisition. So you can calibrate in the morning, say, okay, apply to all uh, the acquisition I will do today. And then you will have uh, all uh, your data uh, calibrated uh, on your measurements. The good thing is that if you somehow want to go back to an automatic calibration, you can always go back to auto calibrate. So even if you say, I want to apply the calibration to the acquisition, we have always the calculated IRF. So you can always uh, get back to the higher harmonic uh, afterwards. Sounds good to me, thank you. But I think yesterday what happened uh, is that uh, um, you went into the calibration window and uh, the harmonic was selected uh, and then uh, you cannot change it anymore. Possibly. Yeah. Okay. This uh, is uh, the other tool I wanted to show um, as ratio. But the beauty, f the beauty of this data is actually that my colleagues acquired STED also. Beautiful STED image and beautiful phasers. So you see from the confocal phaser here to the STED phaser, something that Daniel already showed yesterday. I have to change the program now, sorry.
so what you can see that is interesting in these phasers is that you had clearly the two clouds from the confocal up there. And you can see that the two dyes that you have here have been depleted. So you have now two set trajectories that are going down. Yes, this how. So uh, there's a question about, can I import a previous calibration on the phasers? Uh, the answer is yes. One additional comment here from my side. Um, I mean, this uh, um, separating two dice with the help of the phaser is something that Mariano showed beautifully in his hands-on session yesterday. However, on the software version that he was running it in, it was um, yeah, quite a quite a manual thing to do, but it worked nicely. Here, this is, has been taken now one step further um, in this latest software release where yeah, Julia has showed you already that you can uh, nicely do this now in an automated way. But the principle behind this is the same that what Mariano showed you yesterday. May I ask which software version that is? This is 4.1, so it's the latest release. So we had it uh, from the launch of Stellaris, so from 4.0. We introduce um, um, the separation of phasers, and with the second uh, release of Stellaris, uh, we introduce actually a new flame uh, system, uh, data format that uh, allows to compress uh, without uh, losing data up to eight times uh, the flame data, and that is improving uh, analysis uh, and, of course, uh, space of storage of flame data, and we call it FlimZip. So these are the new things that were not in the SP8, uh, but they are now in uh, Stellaris 8 Falcon. And as um, um, Luis was pointing out, uh, this is uh, the nice uh, stead effect on the background part uh, and here on uh, the, the fluorophores. So, you see exactly how they are pulled. And this uh, tells you also different effect on the different concentration. So if you have a high concentration of um, the actin, I have to check. <laughs> on the actin, this will be put less into the background uh, compared to the low concentration of actin. And we can do the same exercise as we did before or to separate uh, on uh, the stead. Oh, I can just put the. I will uh, use the same colors uh, we used before. And uh, if I separate, uh, I will hide uh, the confocal now. Oh, see, I missed something. So you see, if I put the green. Uh, too much inside, uh, I will lose uh, the contribution uh, of this. Uh, and that's what actually I told before, you should really put uh, the cursor at the extreme where you think your pure component is. And voila. And here you see clearly the, the background uh, and here is the same effect. Uh, and I can uh, decrease. Uh, you can see your three contribution really clearly on a stead image. Questions? I have another application of the phase of separation that might be of interest. Okay. I don't have the image now. Interesting. <laughs> okay, I had an image before. Ah, hmm. if I don't check the detector, then it's difficult to have an image. So that is was a rookie mistake. Okay, this is a um, brain slice with uh, neurons uh, um, label expressing GFP. Uh, it was fixed uh, with uh, glutaral data and then uh, measured with flim with um, multi-photon system. 
So what uh, we can see is already there are one, one cloud, two cloud, three clouds. And uh, this is uh, really following a manual uh, of phasor algebra because we have uh, this, that is the longest lifetime that is coming from the GFP. In fact, uh, our phase lifetime is around 2.2 nanosecond. Then uh, we have a shorter component uh, that is coming from the autofluorescence of the tissue. You can see here, and I can uh, explore this part. Can you see the green here? So it's really following all the tissue. And then I have something uh, with very few counts. So when you see a cloud that is really blue in the phasor plot, that means you don't have a lot of counts as well and not uh, a lot of pixels that are contributing to that. And if we put a magenta as we did before, I have to pimp up the, sorry, I know it's saturated, but to show you where the magenta is, that is the only way because we waited to show better. So it's just here. And then what we can do is use a separate. And of course the pixels here will be in the three channels. Um, and you can see your GFP, yeah, I made it red. I think uh, it should be fine, no? Or you want it green? I can switch color, but I think it's uh, not needed. And if you overlap, you can see the contribution from the glutal raid uh, fixation. Uh, um, cannot see the... Uh, <laughs> interesting, I want to... Move. Okay, because otherwise it's going to write. So the three component, uh, we can uh, definitely zoom in and see the different background. So this is so the GFP signal is clearly coming from the cells. The green part is coming from tissue, and this is uh, from the fixation. And we have uh, some contribution if we really from the background here and we should not have uh, as much you see the green there is nothing green there and i will expect uh, basically zero oops red in the middle so we could really find uh, where our contribution uh, are coming from uh, directly from the phasor plot. And I really like this example in which uh, the phasor is moving to the background where you have lower concentration. And that uh, is actually what uh, Rupsa data used uh, to determine the concentration of uh, NADH. Where you have less NADH, you will have a um, higher contribution uh, of the background. So you could really wait uh, and uh, find out uh, concentrations uh, through the phasors. Questions so far? Uh, if not... There I'll... is one about what is the difference or wavelet versus medium filter. Okay, so medium filters, I will start... Oh. 23, no, we never use 23. So usually the median should be used uh, up to five top. And what it does uh, is uh, taking uh, five, uh, mm, let me zoom in a little bit. So it will take a uh, square uh, five, uh, three by three or five by five, depending, or, depending on the number is here, pixels and calculate the phasors with all the photons acquired in this region. This is uh, the classical filter used uh, in phasors. Um, and while uh, we were developing Tausted, um, we realized that that was not the best filter if you want to keep uh, spatial resolution. Because uh, if you're pulling the information all together, can imagine, for example, I think the study example is really nice. If you put together five 
three by three pixel in a stead image, you will have your center donor and the outer donor contributing together. So the phaser will not really help you in uh, distinguish the different components uh, and uh, you will lose uh, the resolution. With the wavelet filter, we are using uh, um, uh, this wavelet approach. So is uh, um, is keeping uh, is summing up uh, using the different um, um, photons, but uh, is not uh, losing uh, the spatial resolution. So it's really uh, uh, the way to go uh, for. Uh, small structure and we actually as i said we implemented for tausted in which we had uh, some artifact with the median and now we basically have it as default filter for any image because we see that also on uh, the background and edges uh, is working definitely better in discriminating uh, the the feature Julia, do you mind actually selecting a couple images to show how yep. uh, will, what you um, have uh, shown here will translate into analyzing multiple images and that you can just transfer the phaser for analysis? If you had like your sample control and set your phasers and then I use it to... Yeah. So it's another question, there, there, this one. Yes, okay. the, exactly. Ah, uh, I was okay. If, I was confused if, about that. No, no, the, no. Okay. Yeah, yeah. If you can apply the same phaser analysis to other images for comparison. Okay. And so see. for example, we can, uh, actually that we could do it directly on uh, our biosensing. So I will move to the next topic in which we have a flipper TR. Uh, I think I, fl I separate them. Yeah. Okay, so here, I will have uh, the two image or, uh, you know what I, you know, I change the program. We start with FRET because for this question, FRET is the best example where we really need to have multiple image to build up uh, our FRET trajectory. So you have just to select uh, your different data in the project. Here I have region of it. I, and then if you want to visualize the phasers, you have just to check all of them here. They will be weighted uh, by the pixel that are contributing. So for example, the autofluorescence data will be kind of dimmer, but if I uncheck the other, you will see is auto scaled back. But in this way, you can really see all uh, your contribution of the three image. And um, with I, you will select uh, the image that will be shown here. So image uh, the first that is just the donor. I can have the donor in a scepter, so the FRET sample, and I can have the autofluorescence as image. So how we build uh, the um, FRET trajectory, uh, as it was in the talk, you have to start uh, with your autofluorescence. You go to your donor only. Then I will make it bigger so you can see. And then you have uh, your uh, experimental data here. You see, this is, these are my fret phasers, my fret cloud. So now I could actually delete all the others. And what you have to do is adjust the background that is contributing to the, uh, to the fret to make it go through the fret trajectory. So it's uh, an empirical uh, approach how to build the fret trajectory. And then what you can do is uh, moving your cursor and if I, you see, I'm selecting this area where the fret efficiency is 10% uh, almost. Then I will tell you what it is and then you understand why the fret efficiency is so high. This is 17%. Can you see the red is a good contrast? Just, well, I think this monitor is not. This is 22% and here is 27%. Uh, and, and it looks good, they were right. Okay, 
thank you. And uh, how can I get to this high fret efficiency? This is basically labeling uh, the same structure with two different antibodies that have a good spectral overlap. So we have uh, a tubulin stain with Alexafluor 488 and Alexafluor 555. And these, uh, of course, they are spectrally overlapping. They're going to the same structure. So the fret efficiency, especially where you have high density, is very high. So, and this is a, a way uh, which we had our demo samples uh, um, and so far I think is uh, a, not scientifically relevant, uh, but um, uh, at least for analysis is uh, a really nice uh, tool. We are sure that is uh, fretting. And as I mentioned during the talk, uh, it may happen uh, that your donor is not more exponential and look where the phasor of our donor is. Uh, it's really not on the universal circle. So this uh, has already some extra contribution. And if you would have had uh, to do a fret flame analysis uh, with the exponential uh, decay approach, uh, you would have had to take in account uh, how the, this multi-exponential behavior influence your fret. That is something that people do that is uh, kind of easy to model, but to model the fact that you have a donor that is multi-exponential and you have always a contribution of autofluorescence, that is not easy to do. So the phaser will really help you in uh, having more possibilities to use a fret pair as well and not worry too much about uh, uh, the donor part. The important thing in this type of study you know, is uh, the sample preparation. So here, of course, we had to prepare three different samples. We had the donor, the donor acceptor, and the autofluorescence. And uh, you know, lifetime depends uh, a lot uh, on uh, the microenvironment. So the cells have to be same passage, uh, same uh, treatment, uh, and same uh, uh, fixation protocol uh, and mounting media because otherwise uh, that will uh, change your three reference and then uh, you will not be able to get a, a FRET trajectory. In live cells, this uh, or where you see a FRET occurring in time that might be easier because you have a, usually an internal control like uh, in the case of the biosensors. Okay. I see that there are more questions uh, popping up. Should I read? Uh, I agree there were a lot of questions between the differences in the software of the SP8 version and now with the Stellaris version. Maybe you can... As I said, there are not too many differences uh, so far. So we have uh, the flim zip ability as a new flim data type uh, that uh, allows you to have less... Uh, disk space, like uh, really physically space on your computer for the film data, because we optimize uh, how to save and record them. And uh, uh, the phaser separation, all the other tools uh, are, have been, uh, stayed the same. So there is no, no other differences. So there is always the exponential uh, tools uh, with uh, all the things that you have seen uh, probably in the workshop before. We have the fret analyzer based on the exponential fitting. Uh, we have pattern fit. Uh, we have the phasers. Uh, in the case of STED system, we have uh, tau -STED, uh, And then uh, yeah, the mean, mean IRI is an analysis tool to see in time uh, how your lifetime is changing. But there is uh, nothing newer in the latest uh, uh, version uh, of the SP8, you had already the wavelet. Uh, so I will recommend if you don't have the latest version uh, to install it uh, because it's really improving the quality of the phasers uh, and uh, my advice. Uh, there, uh, otherwise, everything is included in the SP8 Falcon already. We did, uh, I think the big uh, 
things that was included in the software are still in the SPA time was the phaser part. That was the, the biggest new things uh, since Falcon launch. Other, other questions? Oh, yeah, Julia, may I ask a question? Sure. This is this is Hella. Hello. And I'm I have a question for my understanding that I'm struggling with because I was playing before with spectral phases, hmm. and there I also could not figure out because now here you have a tool where you can just draw in one region of interest manually, just a round one, for instance, mm -hmm. and you can draw another one, and you showed example. If, you, if they partially overlap. So what is the software doing in the phaser unmixing if the regions partially overlap? Because it's a yes or no answer in the, if you don't have the automatic Stellaris version thingy, right? Yeah, so if you don't have uh, the separate uh, tool uh, in uh, what I will uh, um, suggest probably to be able to separate them. So one thing, oh, well actually, sorry, I added them already. So I can use uh, the one we have here. So basically this, you will make it bigger. Maybe more. <laughs> Oops, no, 300 is too much. Oh, so yesterday. yeah, this is what Mariano show yesterday, I think. Uh, so then uh, basically this uh, will be what you will uh, do. But you see already here are these pixels that have uh, a lot of contribution of uh, this. And that is where troubles become, uh, are coming, as you said. One thing that can be done is using the ratio tool and calculate in this part, uh, these pixels, uh, how many photons are coming from one and the other and actually it's a 50-50%, 50-50. And uh, that is how the separation in Stellaris works. And uh, in um, for the previous version, what you, you will have to do is basically saying that this pixel have to go to the two channels somewhere in another script or something, but it will be really difficult to separate uh, when you have them overlapping. So it will be the same uh, in the case of the actin and vimentin in the central part of the cells. Uh, it will be basically impossible to say how many will go to one part or the other. Uh, one way to visualize it uh, could be maybe, it depends also a lot on uh, all, uh, about the, how much they are overlapping. Like this uh, will give you already an idea of, uh, okay, this is GFP 100%, uh, this is uh, GFP 70%, uh, this is 50-50, uh, the green and the blue is uh, tissue autofluorescence. I don't know if this might help. Uh, as so that, 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 means, that means technically I can draw in overlapping regions? but it doesn't make sense. So just don't do it. Exactly, it, it, it will not give you anything that that will, will help a lot because the overlapping part uh, will have a 70% contribution of one, 30% of the other. And the only way to separate will be getting out really each photon and say 30 out of 130 goes there and 70 goes there. So yes. Thank, uh, you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, I think this is a, kind of uh, acceptable visualization because then you can uh, so show you could scale it up with uh, using the ratio tool and say okay the green the red is 100% the blue is 100% uh, and uh, you have uh, this green as 50 but um, yeah it will not separate the two channels automatically sorry <laughs> one thing that maybe you don't know you have, uh, is uh, the film simulator that uh, 
if you have, uh, you can simulate uh, different uh, lifetimes. And uh, you can also say how many photons are coming from for each one. So in this case, we will have a 33% contribution of each. And uh, it's basically... Yeah. <laughs> it's basically giving a way to see the ratio and uh, we forgot to have the third, another pattern that is the mix of the first and the third. But yeah, usually there should be another pattern with on this line. Um, and this will help um, maybe in training uh, to understand uh, the algebra of phasors. Uh, and I wanted just to mention that these tools uh, can be interesting to to explore the algebra of phasors. Uh, and also, if you have different contribution of uh, different fluorophores, how far apart they should be for me to see a difference uh, in the phasor. And in this case, I put a pattern. So you have, uh, uh, you should have six uh, parts, uh, yes, five. But uh, what uh, you can, uh, you can do is having them all mix uh, and then it will be only one cloud. Uh, and then you say, okay, I cannot separate anything. Of course, if you have all the, the fluorophores mixed together, phaser will not be able to differentiate them. It will, uh, you have to extract uh, the different parts uh, thanks to different localization. That is one of the limitation of phasers uh, while uh, uh, in that case, uh, exponential fitting could help uh, in find out the contribution to that population. Uh, in the phaser, you will always need your pure or close to pure point uh, to be able to distinguish uh, from the mixture. Okay. Um, now uh, we have... <laughs> I think we have more than 10 minutes, Stefan, <laughs> since we start a little bit late. Um, I wanted to, to show you a little bit uh, on uh, the biosensing part. I think it's a very important application uh, of uh, FLIM. Uh, um, Julia, hmm? do you mind if I ask a quick question on the yeah. threats before you move yeah, on? Sure. Um, so, you know, when you had all those little options to build the trajectory um, and you had like autofluorescence, donor, um, were those all separate images that you take and then add them together? Yeah. So these are three different images. In uh, this case, uh, I add them um, um, from three fixed samples. Uh, usually the autofluorescence, uh, you, so you need three samples, basically. Also, if you're looking uh, into live cells, uh, you will need always uh, the donor as reference. Uh, and autofluorescence, I would say, is highly recommended. Uh, but um, if you put something in the center of the universal circle, usually you are on the safe side. As you said, uh, you saw probably also yesterday with the metabolic imaging, uh, autofluorescence is somewhere here. <laughs> so that will not change too much the threat results uh, as long as you are not moving it around. But it's always um, um, a good approach to have the three samples, so the three measurements. Mm -hmm. So yeah. is that um, nothing for the autofluorescence donor only and then donor plus acceptor? Exactly. So you will have uh, where, where I will go in case my donor is all quenched because it's 100% in threat, so the autofluorescence. Then you will need to know where you start. So you need the donor alone. Or uh, in the case of biosensors, uh, that is sometimes it's difficult to have the donor alone because it's what uh, you do is having uh, an on position and an off position. So you are saturating the biosensor or you are depleting. So in a way that you can see the two starting and end points. So the two points, you need those. Okay. Um, um, and then just one last thing. When you choose your donor plus acceptor, if you've taken like, I don't know, five different ones, can you, you know, go through them one by one and keep donor and autofluorescence? 
Yes, so basically what uh, I always recommend in the case of FRET is really to, to try to open uh, the files all together. So you just select uh, the 20 cells, uh, five cells that you have uh, and keep the analysis done, yes. Cool, thank you. <laughs> no problem. Other questions? Okay. Uh, I asked a question about the uh, omega for TCSPC and I got an answer that that's the laser repetition rate. But can't one arbitrarily pick any omega for this Fourier transform? Then yes. one have a different appearance of the. So how how do you pick the optimal one? So that we should make the Fourier transform. This is a, a really good question. So uh, you start uh, with the laser repetition because uh, it's the first uh, uh, frequency in which uh, you have uh, a period, so then a frequency. Yes. Then uh, you can uh, like uh, do the harmonics, what they do, the harmonics, uh, if I start uh, uh, 80 mega, uh, 40 megahertz, uh, it will go second harmonic 80 megahertz. Uh, and so, so it will just uh, um, expand uh, the, and change. But usually you start uh, from your repetition rate as a starting point. Uh, I think it's kind of conventional. So usually harmonic one uh, is the repetition rate in the case of um, time domain. And then you have the, all the other harmonics. But theoretically you could get any, that's why in the the only issues that you might have is with the calibration because the calibration has to be consistent so you, in the calibration point you have to say for which frequency you do it mm -hmm. so that's when uh, um, you decide uh, that you cannot move anything else but since we do the calculation on the irf uh, then there is no limit in changing quickly the frequency thank you thank you welcome and actually the harmonic uh, uh, might be very useful when uh, you have very short uh, lifetimes. Uh, I don't know, I think if we go to the stat image. So um, I go to fast flame because it's nice. But basically it will uh, do a transformation of the phasor plot that is not linear. So here we will open more. So if I go to phase two, it will move. Uh, oh, I piece of I was in the wrong one. <laughs> it will move uh, in this direction. And you see that now the two components are getting more farther apart, but the longer one are getting closer. So I think the, the high harmonic are very useful when you are working with very short lifetimes. So we had a few histological slides in which the, all the phasor were in this area. And by using uh, the second and the third harmonic, we were able to see different contribution way better than uh, having it on the first harmonic. So I will advise to explore the harmonics in the case of very short lifetimes. If you have long lifetime, it doesn't really help because they will be all squeezed in this part at the end. So that will not help. And if you have uh, low fret efficiencies, in our system, we often have only 5%. Uh, is still uh, this phaser approach useful? In yeah. Your yeah. Yeah. Uh, and as I said, especially if uh, you don't start with a mono exponential. Um, uh, decay uh, donor that helps uh, a lot mm -hmm. um, on the other hand with so low fret efficiency the exponential fitting is also doing well i have to be honest because uh, the auto fluorescence contribution is very low because your donor is emitting 90 yeah. percent so but uh, phasor will help uh, as well I mean, from you you could distinguish them and we don't have a lake, but we have a pick of one. So which software would you recommend to start with this phasor analysis? So for phasor analysis, uh, I mean, Enrico has a CMFCS, uh, but I don't know how big the data um, can be. So how big can the data big, uh, be to, to be analyzed? 
So um, that is something that before getting the software, I will ask. Mm. Because I mean, with FICO, we usually get really huge data because you can do tile scan, 3D, you can do a lot of uh, big images uh, and uh, CMFCS is uh, struggling. Um, I don't know how big will be your images. Uh, so that might be one of, uh, I think uh, Yele Hendrix uh, in uh, Leuven, uh, he has also some software that can do phasers. So there is Enrique as well in, in France, but uh, I've just had to grab something to launch. So I'm not on my computer. If you pass your uh, question to Daniel Smet, we can send you a link with a couple of options. options. Yes. Uh, some of them that are obscure uh, software packages that only live in some university server. Exactly. But, and, uh, yeah. Yeah. and that is uh, actually one of uh, the drawbacks because the reason that someone that is, uh, he wrote uh, his uh, script on phaser for the PhD or postdoc and then uh, they just let it go. Yes. So um, that, but I will uh, really also look on uh, on some papers and see and contact directly some author, but I think there are few few options, uh, especially by collaborating or asking. I think, uh, there are. but I think commercially, CMFCS is the first one that comes to my mind, uh, basically. But okay. from history. Yes. And by the way, we have all the tools, or almost all the tools here, so. Um, but we cannot read PicoQuant data. We can export PicoQuant data, so PTU and PT stream, but uh, we don't read it. Um, sorry, yeah. ask really quickly. So if, you, if you're expecting quite a high autofluorescence contribution, um, or you've got a multi-exponential donor, Will phaser plots be your recommended analysis choice? Yes, it will. So when you have uh, a lot of contributions, uh, uh, I will always recommend phasers uh, because, uh, I mean, you cannot uh, fit an exponential decay with uh, four components. I mean, you can, but then uh, you will have uh, a lot of variability and you could fit anything. So then uh, to control the analysis is getting very complicated. With the phaser, you will see the changes uh, due to the contribution. And the, the fact that they are linear is the big advantage, that you can really tell uh, what is contributing to what. Uh, so. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. I will quickly show you the um, um, biosensing part. So here, what... Um, oh. Somehow is slow in uh, in showing the image. So I have the face, but I don't have the image. And I had it before, so it's there. Ah, no, again. Okay. I have a direct uncheck uh, detector. So this is a, a big stack uh, from a tissue, uh, I think it's a gut, um, stained with Nile red. So Nile red uh, is a fluorophore that goes to membranes and uh, depending on the lipid uh, uh, composition, uh, it has different uh, lifetime. So already on the fast flame, so the average arrival time, we can see some differences. Uh, in, uh, in the arrival time. So we have a lipid droplet. We have the membrane of the cells. And then I think it's the lumen of uh, the gut. So it's, uh, this was acquired with a multi-photon system. And um, what you see, if you see the overall, so here we sum up uh, all the pixel of all the phasers, uh, so uh, of all the images. Uh, uh, so we have a lot of points. Uh, and uh, we can see we have uh, a long contribution here. We have uh, 
alpha. I have to go somewhere else, otherwise this, I can just put it here. And one here, and I make it as uh, Louise suggested, magenta. And we can separate. Um, so, and that actually, okay, this is, I need a little bit of, I need to pimp up a little bit the scale, but it was already separated. So an advantage with the phase of separation compared to a exponential fitting in this case is the speed. We had 72 slides. Uh, I think it's 512, 512 of 1K by 1K. I can just check how big. Uh, so 1K by 1K. And it was done uh, in a few seconds. Okay, it's not my laptop, but uh, um, with, if you would have done a three component uh, pixel by pixel fitting, it would have taken a few minutes, even with Falcon. And um, if we overlap the three, what I wanted to show is that we can see how the different uh, region of your of the samples maybe i change this to yellow oh i know i have to change it here um, i always get confused um, yellow magenta and this we put it cyan so we go for ymc and uh, You can uh, see there the, the lipid droplets in uh, magenta going around. Then uh, we have uh, main membrane around. And then with the yellow, we have outer. And actually, in some plane it's clear that the yellow is outside uh, and just after there is the science. So there is really a difference in the lipidic composition in some membrane. One thing that uh, I wanted to show you is that you can always uh, split uh, your image and uh, your face or now will have only the contribution of the image that is shown here. Uh, you see here the membrane in magenta and uh, yellow and the cyan inside. And if you move the Z, you will see how the phaser is different. And closer for, from the outer part, the different contribution. Uh, it looks like. And uh, this, uh, now I'm doing it uh, in, uh, in Z, so we can see the different membrane uh, contribution. But in, this was a fixed sample. So there is no need to do it, but you could do this split function of the image in the phaser um, also in time. And that's what I did uh, with the flipper TR to follow the changes uh, during the glucose uh, mistreatment of the cells uh, when they were shrinking. And uh, a way to see these differences uh, will be maybe to use the separate if you know how much they are changing. Another way could be to check uh, with, uh, with uh, our rainbow. Oh, I always go the other way around. <laughs> with the rainbow tool, where the different uh, components are. So the region in which they have uh, shorter Life, so coming from this part of the phasers and longer at the, in, at the inside, inside the, the tissue, basically. And if you see in the, if I split my stack, I have really troubles in see the contribution of the um, lipid droplets. And this is because I have very few pixels contributing in each stack to this component. Um, so that's why what, when I say that you have to zoom in uh, to, to 
get a lot of information that is what, and actually you can select a region of interest. And we can just check this, but also in the region of interest with a lot of droplets, it's really difficult to get the pixel out. So you need to get uh, the contribution of the lipids to droplets, you need a lot of uh, pixel coming from them. And unfortunately they are really small. <laughs> So, are there any questions? Uh, uh, Julia, there was one thing. Chat. There was one thing from, from earlier that um, was um, kind of skipped then at some point. So let's assume I have uh, recorded fifty objects, say cells or whatever I want to look at. I do all the phase analysis on one of them, and everything works fine. How do I transfer the analysis <laughs> to the next one? Do I have to do it by hand, or is there like a copy and paste for the template. That is a nice feature request. Uh, so we don't have a way to transfer the phasers analysis, uh, but I, I see the application need. So I think this is a nice feature request. Uh, I will write it down. And um, what, uh, what you should do is really open uh, all the images uh, at the same time. So the point is that mm -hmm. if you have uh, more than 50, it's getting complicated. Yeah. Okay, and then um, related to that, a question that Martin has put in the uh, in the chat is: um, Let's assume I do this and I get very nice results. Um, where do I get some data from, or how can I read out some data for my methods part for the paper? What I've actually done. So, um, is there like in in the metadata? Does it say put this to that position or something so that um, I can reproduce that? Um, from, from, no. from what, the data. what I will suggest is save uh, results. Mm -hmm. So when you're done with analysis, if you save results, then uh, you can call it uh, analysis uh, 27 November 2020. And then uh, in projects, you have analysis of 2020 and here you will have all these uh, saved. So you will have the, exactly this window, even if uh, you are doing something else uh, in, in your data. So my data will be here, but my analysis uh, will have this information. So that's kind of a visual um, reminder of how, how, I, how, how I've done things, but there is no easy way to describe this for the methods part in a few words or something. Like giving a few parameters that would uh, allow me to go back there. So at this there point, is, uh, no, there is no, so in property there is no, also it's the same uh, actually in the, for the exponential part. Uh, or, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's the same. We don't have anything in the metadata regarding the analysis. So. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, if you are, I can uh, move to the last example I have uh, for biosensing that was uh, Flipper TR. We started late, so I think we can give us a few more minutes. Or if there are questions uh, related really to, to the software uh, that uh, we could uh, spend the next 10 minutes. I think this uh, basically is the movie I should ruin the presentation. And uh, what uh, I wanted to show is that you can uh, uh, export. So if you save phasers, you can uh, save it uh, here and it will create uh, a phaser plot. Uh, huh? It didn't update. Okay. Where <laughs> it's showing the wrong file. <laughs> I see here the preview is correct, but this is not the right file. Mm. Save phasers. Okay. Okay, something is wrong. So, but it will, uh, <laughs> it should have uh, created the movie of uh, what we have seen uh, 
here, sorry, with the, that is what I showed. And uh, I think you, oh, in the 3D viewer, I think you're aware of the 3D viewer within the, the phasers uh, and within Falcon. So basically you could uh, export uh, the movie directly. So uh, that's how I export the movie. And then I synchronize basically the play between the two. And I think it, save phasers uh, or uh, right click export image uh, is the way to get out the phasers if you need it for a publication uh, or for um, presentations, basically. Okay, I'm having an eye on the chat. Check whether so. Um... One thing that I would like to highlight: uh, so one advantage of phaser compared to like exponential fitting is that uh, it doesn't go. So you know, for exponential fitting, if you have uh, one component, you need 100 photons per pixel. If you have two, you will need 500, and then uh, there are different theory for the three components. The advantage of the phasers uh, being a 2D rep um, representation of what happens uh, in your pixel allows you to be independent on the number of components. Uh, so basically, if you have uh, around 100 uh, photon per pixels, uh, you should be completely fine. The important thing compared to the exponential fitting is that you have to zoom in. So you should not have a lot of backgrounds uh, for um, uh, for flim from phasers uh, analysis, uh, because uh, if you have a lot of uh, background, uh, then uh, is uh, getting uh, uh, very sparse uh, the clouds. So you will not have a lot of contribution. So that I think is something that makes the two methods uh, different. Uh, and uh, so if you have a uh, very sparse uh, Distribution maybe exponential fitting pixel by pixel helps more than uh, mm, phasers, uh, but in standard image uh, with multi exponential fit mm, components, uh, phasers has uh, a lot of strength. Uh, and I hope I show that today. Okay. Um, do we have any more open questions at this point? Um, I I don't think there is something left in the chat, but maybe there is. So. If there is something you would like to ask, this would be the time. Um, if you have other questions later on that comes to your mind, feel free to send an email. Uh, I think my contact should be around. I mean, is uh, otherwise I could forward it. Exactly, yeah. but I will be more. Thank you very much for the offer. Well, yeah. uh, and thank and sorry for the interaction uh, in between. Don't but, worry yeah. about it. Um, so I think this was pretty interesting. Even I learned a few things, although I, uh, we have the work and the uh, phaser already running here for some time. And um, so I thought it was very interesting. And everybody who knows, who has kids of his own knows he did an outstanding job today. So thank you very much. Um, <laughs> this is just the time we're living in right now in 2020. And so um, I don't see a problem at all with that. Um, Thank you. Thank you for understanding. So uh, let's have a few more faces. Um, so thank you, Julia. Um, Thank you. And also for the others who contributed. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for being there. And maybe we'll see you again um, then in the next workshop, then with um, some um, open source solution that will be presented by Ali um, or in the later um, workshop, um, which is about the camera film there. Okay. Um, I guess that was it for now. Goodbye. Thank you. See you. Have fun with Falcon. Bye. Yeah. <laughs>